Hello, hello, welcome to section 2.3, latency-based consensus, where we're gonna talk about the 99% fault tolerant consensus algorithm, which is based around synchrony assumptions that we learned about in the previous section. So, we just talked about the double spend problem, where Mallory was able to buy both a movie and a song when Mallory did not have the funds to do so. And the way that Mallory was able to achieve this was Mallory sent, propagated those transactions selectively, and it caused the nodes to become out of sync. They were no longer in consensus. So they didn't agree on who got paid. This is a serious problem. Now the reason why this happened was because we are ordering the messages, these transactions, by the time they were received. But each node was receiving the transactions transactions at a different time. And so, of course, this is going to happen because they're all across the world. They're going to receive transactions at the same time. So it's impossible for this to be all we need for a consensus. So we had these balances and they got out of sync. How can we solve this? Well, turn that frown upside down. We can do this. So how are we going to do this? Well, we can just add timestamps. And so when a transaction is created, the signer can just include a timestamp saying, this was the time that I created this transaction. So for instance, here, Alice sending to Jing, we look at the time and we'll say, oh, okay, it's 1010. That sounds about right. And we'll include it in our transaction and sign. Now, ordering by timestamps. This is an alternative. Note what will happen if we try to order by timestamps. So here we're going to look at these transactions. We notice that it's 1010, 1015, 1020. That seems to be all good. It's all in order. So what we'll do is we'll apply all these transactions and generate a state. And in this state, you know, Alice gets paid. Now we do the same thing on the other side, but note that our transactions are out of order, right? There's 1020 and then 1015. That's incorrect. So we have to swap them to make sure that they're all progressing in time and so we'll do the same thing we'll check to make sure now it's all correct great and then we will output the state and notice that because we have ordered it by the timestamp the states are going to be the same we're not going to have any of those inconsistent state problems that we had before so that's pretty great you know, we've got agreement, we've got consensus, awesome. Oh no, not so fast. Unfortunately, Mallory has an evil idea again. There are two attacks that are still problematic even with this timestamp ordering. First, Mallory can lie about the timestamp. And the second problem is Mallory can selectively propagate transactions. So first, let's look at the lying about a timestamp. How, what does Mallory do? Well, if you notice here, Alice was paid, right? Alice got the 100 coins. And so that means that Alice owes the movie to Mallory, right? Just as she should. And Jing did not receive the money because these transactions were invalid. So Jing just says, no, I'm not gonna give you the music. However, there's still something evil that Mallory can do. Mallory can generate a transaction which has a timestamp of 10.05, even if it is currently 10.30, right? So this is clearly a lie. The timestamp is not really 10.05. However, Mallory is going to do it anyway. And then Mallory is going to send that transaction to both Jing and Alice. Now, when Jing and Alice want to run these transactions, they'll need to make sure that they're correctly ordered. And notice that they're not, right? 10.05 is later than 10.20. So we have to take that transaction and put it at the top. Now, if we were to look at the transactions, the ordering is correct by the timestamp. However, when we output the state, Alice did not get paid. However, Alice did send the movie. So Mallory has just gotten away with movie theft, the worst kind of crime and notice right Alice has no money that's not okay attack successful unfortunately now the second problem is Mallory can selectively propagate these messages so Mallory is going to generate those two double spend transactions as she did before but she's going to selectively propagate them just as she did before. Now notice that when we output the state, of course we're going to come up with different balances because you know they don't have a complete view of each other's transactions, right? 
Alice thinks that the only transaction was the 1015 transaction, while Jing thinks the only transaction is the 1020 transaction to her. And so they're out of sync, and that's because their histories are different, so their state is going to be different too. So if we wanted to kind of solve this, they'd have to wait until they get back in sync, and then they do the proper ordering by transaction output, and then we get the right, the right state and we're in consensus again. But remember that there was a moment there when they were out of sync, and that's a problem. So this is good because they both have the same transactions, but it's bad when they don't. So that means that we can say that we can form consensus if, one, we mitigate attack one, lying about the timestamp, and the way we mitigate that is by rejecting late transactions. And the second thing is we can mitigate attack two, this selective propagation, by guaranteeing that all transactions are seen by all honest participants. So with that, dun, 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 attack failed. We squashed that mal. Now, how does this work? Well, dun, 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 dun. guide to 99% fault tolerant consensus. Vitalik came out with a blog post, and this is actually an old consensus protocol from a while back, and it allows us to have 99% fault tolerant consensus. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, we have a network, and the network has a bunch of participants. Maybe most of them are bad. Look at this network. It's like almost all Mallory's. That's no good. But there are two honest participants, Jing and Alice. And the cool thing is by using this protocol, well, they're actually going to be able to stay in sync and they will achieve consensus no matter even if it's a huge field of Mallory's. So that's pretty cool. That's a really cool property. Now, we had this broken solution where we would propagate all transactions and then just hope for the best. Well, there's actually a working solution and so let's look at what that is. Now, here we have our list of transactions just like before. And in our current protocol, we always accept transactions. However, that has a problem because it means that Mallory can just lie about the timestamp. So we can't do that. Instead, what we have to do is we have to only accept transactions if they're received before a timeout, right? Otherwise, they're rejected. So we don't allow Mallory to do that lying about timestamp attack. Now, how do we calculate this timeout? Well, the timeout is going to be given by this formula and we'll talk about what that really means first t is the timestamp of the transaction so in this case it's 1005 and now d is the upper bound on the time it takes for one message to propagate so this is our synchrony assumption which is currently set at five seconds and then lastly we have this k which is the number of observers so let's kind of dive right into what those observers mean so, right, we have this upper bound. This is based on our synchrony assumption. Note that this is a strong assumption. We will talk about that in a moment. Remember. Now, the second thing is K. Let's talk about what that means. So first, Mallory is going to generate a transaction which has signed at 10.05, sending 100 to Alice. Now, what Alice is going to do is Alice is going to sign that she observed that transaction. And that means that K is equal to 1. And then then Alice will send that transaction to Jing, Jing will sign that transaction, setting k equal to 2, and then once again Jing will send that to Bob, and Bob will sign that he observed that transaction setting k equal to 3. And so here we can actually just plug in the numbers, and we'll do the math and we'll notice that the timeout for the first message here, k equals 1, is 1020, the second one is 1030, and the last one is 1040, right? So this is how we calculate the timeout. Now, we can actually visualize this in a little bit of a graph, somewhat similar to the timeline we were looking at before. And now notice that if Alice receives a transaction within this green zone, Alice will accept it. However, Alice will reject any transaction received in that red zone. And the reason why is Alice knows that Alice does not have enough time to propagate that transaction. Now, what happens here, right? Alice will accept it and sign the message and pass it along to Jing. Now, if Alice receives it here, Alice will just throw out the message. No signature, no nothing. Alice does not want to sign it. And the reason why is because Alice knows that Alice won't have enough time to make sure that everyone else got it. But because Jing would have seen Alice's signature and Mallory's signature by this time, Jing will sign it. 
But if we continue going, we will only start accepting the transactions that have been signed by everyone, and that is Bob. Bob has seen all of the signatures thus far. And remember, these signatures can be ordered in whatever way. It just so happens that Alice is sending to Jing and then to Bob. Now, what does this mean? Well, this means that even in the timeout, the max timeout, Bob will still accept that transaction. And why is this the case? Well, Bob will know that everyone has seen the message, which is exactly the property that we're trying to provide. So this makes sense. What we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that everyone has seen every transaction. And so generally speaking, this transaction will go through. However, we are remembering to mitigate attack number one, which is lying about the timestamp. That means that late transactions are rejected. So these transactions, which have 1015 as their timeout and only one signature, they're going to get rejected because they have been received well after the max timeout. And the second thing is, all transactions are seen by all honest participants. This is really, really critical. And why is this the case? Well, it's because when a transaction is received by an honest participant, they're going to propagate it to absolutely everyone. And these timeouts ensure that the propagation time is enough for every honest participant to propagate and then every other honest participant to propagate themselves. And remember that in our synchrony assumption, we assume that Every time Alice wants to send a message or anyone wants to send a message, it's received by all interested parties, all honest parties at the same time. Now, this is based on our synchrony assumption, which is a key thing to remember. Now, let's try replaying the double spend, right? The movie and the, the music. So we take these transactions, we open up our handy dandy timeline and we send the messages. But now note that instead of immediately accepting and responding with a movie and a song, Alice and Jing are going to propagate that message. And then Bob is going to even propagate those messages. And the only time when they actually accept the transaction is when we we hit the max timeout. And why is this? That is because by this time we know that everyone is in sync. And in fact, correct, everyone is in sync. Only Alice received a $100 payment and Jing did not receive anything. So the attack failed, right? Alice is going to send the, mo the movie, but Jing will not send the song. Um, great. Well, it's great for everyone except for Mallory. Sad Mallory. But now, you know, Mallory gets to watch Back to the Future and remember the good old times when we didn't have consensus protocols. Um, anyway, ooh, ooh, what's this? Well, Vlad comes over and says, hey, what's your synchrony assumption, though? Because it turns out that our synchrony assumption is pretty strong. We're assuming that five seconds to propagate messages. But that's really short, right? That's a pretty strong guarantee. What if maybe it's more realistic to say our network messages will propagate within an hour? Or maybe it's a day if we want to be real really safe or maybe a year if we're crazy um, and you know that's okay but the thing is we don't really know how long these messages are going to propagate ever that's just not feasible so if we use the partially synchronous network model where we don't know how long messages are going to propagate we have to change our bounds we have to say it's you know two times delta or two times question mark where we don't know how long it's going to take and that means that none of the nodes know how to calculate this max timeout and that means that they're just going to wait and wait and wait and wait, and that is going to break. And so this consensus protocol only works within the context of a synchronous network, which is a very important property, and it's not that great. So notice that the more safety we want, the longer we have to wait. And remember, this also breaks under partial synchrony. That's not great. However, it can be layered on top of other consensus algorithms, which don't break under partial synchrony, like Casper proof of stake, for instance. And so we can actually take this 99% fault tolerant consensus layer it on top of Casper, replace transactions with Casper finalized blocks, and we'll get, you know, some kind of super Casper. But, you know, that's something that we'll talk about later when we get into maybe proof of stake or proof of work. And, you know, that whole consensus stuff is coming soon. That's going to be really fun. But next up, we're going to talk about the simplest of simplest protocols, and that is proof of authority. So talk to you next time. Boop, boop.